Because then we can start talking about her a little bit. So Daniel Tishner, who is a professor uh, in political science and the director of the Waymore Center for Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. Which is, is it as beautiful as Oregon State? <laughs> oh, much more. Oh, really? <laughs> Our trees are taller, the grass is greener, <laughs> ducks are cuddlier. Than <laughs> Um, he is the author of uh, seven, seven books and edited volumes with two more under contract. Um, and they include the prize winning Dividing Lines Politics of Immigration Control. And Daniel's going to be speaking on immigration today. One of the fun things about doing these introductions is you know, you take a look at the website, the CV, you find out these things that you didn't know about people. It wasn't so much that I didn't know this about you, you're a Carnegie Fellow, and that was in the little bios that we all had, just as um, Chris is a Carnegie Fellow. But because Daniel's a political scientist, and historians will understand this, on historian CVs, we never put in parens how much the grant is, largely because, <laughs> right? Why would we? <laughs> but it turns out, and you know, again, we have to be delicate about this, nobody wants to talk about money, but the Carnegie thing, just so people know, basically was what Jimmy Carter was getting paid every year as president of the United States. So it's a, you know, for us, like a big number. I just didn't realize it. Like, like, you have yeah, to Google it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you want to get us started? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, it's very daunting to start. I feel like I have Jimmy Carter like sitting in the back row, glowering at us. So, we're, so um, from yesterday, from yesterday, I I got a sense from Chris and from our featured speaker that there was like a deep yearning for some untamed political science. Yeah. So, you know, you know, tight uh, causal models, streamlined matrices, robust bar squares, big data, um, but I'll do that another day. <laughs> um, so as someone who studies the history of immigration politics and policy, when uh, Michael Hunt's book brings to mind another classic, which is John Hyam's Strangers in the Land. Um, the, Written in 1955, the book was very much inspired, came right on the heels of um, Joseph McCarthy's hearings. And so for Hyam, uh, there was a real concern about fear-related nationalism. Where's, where's Andrew? God. Oh, OK. Oh, well. So, I'm afraid. Um, and, and also inflamed <laughs> ethnocentrism. Um, and so Hyam's troika of nativist ideas in that book bear some resemblance to Hunt's big three. Um, Anti-radical nativism, anti-Catholicism, and ethnic and racial hierarchy. Um, so two out of three ain't bad. Um, yet Hyam's own thought on immigration policy um, was complex and quite fluid, and uh, in fact went through some considerable change over time in his own life. Uh, and it kind of takes me to the issue that, um, uh, that uh, in fact, our political thoughts around immigration um, has that quality of being extremely fluid, extremely complex, and so forth. So more on Hyam and, uh, at the very end, if time permits. Um, three main points I'd like to try to highlight um, in my brief comments today. The first is what I just said a moment ago. That is, the rich combination and texture of American uh, youth ideas about immigrants and immigration. The second is the usefulness of trying to um, put those ideas into policy motion. What I mean by that is thinking about the collision of these ideas in, uh, in our uh, politics and in thinking about how some ideas rather than others are translated into actual policy outcomes. So by this I mean why do some ideas triumph over others uh, in the policy process? Um, what's the impact in aggregate of having all these rival ideas, uh, competing uh, ideologies on the issue? Um, and third um, is thinking about the interaction of these ideas with structural forces, institutions, interests, and other things. Um, the third thing um, uh, is to bring in Marx's um, uh, rupture, if possible, and that is um, I will uh, suggest that anytime you're looking at, um, at least for me, looking at ideas in the context of immigration, politics, and policy, um, that continuity and change is sown into the very nature of study. It's both. Um, so more on that in a moment. Um, so given the partisan hyperpolarization of US politics in general, and immigration policy in particular, it would be understandable to assume that most Americans fall into two warring ideological camps on immigration questions. 
But my paper begins by uh, explaining both how historically and today the specifics of immigration and refugee policy are complex and elicit a multitude <coughs> of political responses, both at left, right, and center. Um, so just ask, for instance, our, uh, the, the man with the biggest portfolio in Washington, Jared Kushner, uh, whose, <laughs> whose uh, recent effort at comprehensive immigration reform was dead on arrival um, and, and had just as ardent a rejection from Republicans in the <coughs> Senate as Democrats in the House. Um, the core ideas that animate U.S. immigration politics and debate often defy simple binaries, uh, such as restriction versus expansion or openness, or, or xenophobia versus xenophilia. My paper trains a spotlight on how American political leaders, activists, and thinkers conceptualize first immigrant admissions, how they view the size and composition of immigration, and second immigrant rights, what civil, political, and social rights they believe should be granted to newcomers and when. Half of my paper focus, focuses on uh, four rather durable ideological perspectives on immigrant um, admissions and rights. But here we get to continuity and change. There's a continuity in terms of the durability of these, um, I'll describe these uh, kind of, uh, four clusters or four uh, um, uh, compartments in a second. But within, the, within each of these camps, there actually is, um, over time, fluidity and how people understand um, uh, the question at hand. So more on this in just a second. So the first group I describe are classic restrictionists, who ardently favor stringent limits on both immigrant numbers and rights. And I don't think I need to rehearse this, especially for, I think, most of the folks in this audience. Um, uh, this is, you know, um, from the very beginning, anti-federalists like Agrippa, who worried about us keeping separate from foreign mixtures, to Dennis Kearney, famous California uh, Chinese exclusionist, to Josiah Strong, who wrote Our Country. Um, uh, and then you could fast forward to progressive era uh, restrictionists like Henry Cabot Lodge and A. Lawrence Lowell, who both like to use the phrase in their writings that, about the need for homogeneity in democracy. Um, uh, in each of these cases, <clears throat> uh, immigration uh, fuels race suicide. Classic restrictionists also highlight economic dangers that new immigrants pose as job takers and welfare dependents. Um, immigrant, uh, immigration challenges law and border, uh, and um, you can look back at the early 20th century restrictions, for instance, who warned that Italian and Jewish number, newcomers were prone to personal violence, criminality, and radicalism in politics. Um, you can hear very similar echoes um, in, in uh, contemporary uh, nativist uh, language from Patrick Buchanan, Peter Brimlow, Tom Tancredo, Steve King. Um, <clears throat> uh, but what's striking is again within this category and capturing the fluidity is there's you know if if there's a fixation um, of for the uh, early 20th century uh, nativists for instance on legal immigration and fears of southern eastern Europeans um, being unassimilable and uh, leading to racial decline for the country and so forth if you fast forward today much more of the language is, is fixated on porous borders and undocumented immigration and so you can see, I'll, I'll fast forward, but you can see the echoes or resonances across time, but also things shift a bit too, depending on what the particular policy target and particular problem defining what is their main concern. Um, so a second camp I've talked about are liberal cosmopolitans who endorse expansive immigrant admissions and full inclusion of newcomers in the national political community. And I have some stuff on Thomas Paine in this regard. Um, Ralph Walter Emerson, uh, Jane Addams, we can then fast forward to Luis Gutierrez or Jose Antonio Vargas. Um, contrary to classic restrictionist claims about homogeneity, they believe democracy is nurtured by diversity and to borrow Abba Schwartz's phrase, the JFK administration advisor, an open society. Um, uh, so much more to say, I'm, I'm gonna fast forward, because I have lots of stuff to tell you about uh, Charles Sumner and Hyman Bookbinder and so forth, but I won't. I will give you one quote from Hyman Bookbinder, who in the 60s says, the true image of, of America is the kaleidoscope. It is a mosaic of human beings that is always changing, but encased in a basic framework of freedom, of brotherhood, of tolerance. Um, and so if you take something like undocumented immigration, uh, for folks in this camp, uh, one of the most pressing contemporary problems is not the presence of millions of uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States, but rather their status as a vulnerable uh, second-class uh, 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 group in our society. A third uh, 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 camp that I discuss are free market expansionists, 
uh, who embrace immigrant admissions um, to meet labor demands and to promote national prosperity, um, but are not particularly concerned about immigrant rights. Um, so I spent some time with Alexander Hamilton and report on manufacturers to draw this out a bit. Um, Andrew Carnegie um, uh, in, uh, in, in the Gilded Age uh, reflected that immigrants are a golden stream which flows into America each year. And then he crassly added that they're probably worth about $1,500 a person because that's how much a slave sold um, several decades before. Um, uh, Contemporary versions of this, you can think of uh, George W. Bush about wanting to match willing workers with willing employers and so forth. And um, I think one of the most telling examples of kind of this ideology is in uh, 1996 when we were engaged in welfare reform and you had uh, a knockdown, drag out fight in the U.S. Senate about what immigration policy should look like in conjunction with access to, to welfare uh, for uh, immigrants that the, the catchphrase used by Dick Armey, Newt Gingrich, Spencer Abraham to draw uh, folks together was immigration, yes, welfare, no. Okay? So that, I think, is a great motto for this camp of free market expansions. And the final theological tradition that I explore are what I call social justice restrictionists, which I think, I think Chris, you find is the most intriguing category, actually, from our conversations. And these are folks who favor reductions in immigration on the grounds that an unfettered labor supply of, um, um, I'm sorry, an unfettered supply of foreign labor creates economic competition for the country's uh, most vulnerable citizens. It's least advantaged. Um, and you know, a quote that I love to use that I think helps capture this perspective is from Frederick Douglass in the Reconstruction Era, where he looks around and he says, "Every hour sees another freed slave." ebbled out of a job by a newly arrived Irish immigrant. Okay. At the same time, though, free market, uh, I'm sorry, uh, social justice restrictionists um, are usually deeply passionate about once someone is here, once non-citizen or otherwise, once you're here, you should have access to the full membership rights that everyone else enjoys. So it's also Frederick Douglass looking at China's exclusion looking at the riots and the violence that's, that's being, and xenophobia taking place on the West Coast, gives his famous speech about human rights, and specifically talks about those rights needing to be accorded in this country to Chinese and Japanese. Um, you can fast forward on this to other uh, prominent African American leaders, leaders. One of my heroes, Barbara Jordan, is a good example of this. Um, uh, Barbara Jordan, um, uh, is probably most famous for her role in the Watergate hearings and so forth. But during the Clinton years, um, he called on her to be basically the uh, kind of a stateswoman surrounding immigration questions and chairing his commission. And in that role, she talked, she said, we really could probably use a little less immigration and, and, and think about what restrictions we might want to put on immigration um, until we can be guaranteed that the poorest kids in our inner cities have opportunities. But when it came to questions about access to social benefits, she was adamant that those who are here, whether documented, undocumented, from wherever they come from, ought to have the same uh, access to education, health care, and other benefits. Um, by the way, Cesar Chavez is fascinating in this regard. Uh, if you go to the archives and look at Cesar Chavez's um, uh, uh, telegrams and other writings, um, when he's in the middle of the, the, his battles um, in California, he, is, he has some of the worst language to describe Mexican undocumented immigrants as he's sending telegrams to Senator Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, saying, do something about this. Um, um, you fast forward to, to 1973, he takes a, a bit of a different stance on this stuff, but it captures another key component of traditional social justice restrictionists, which is the labor movement. And so I spent some time in the paper and, and other work talking about Samuel Gompers himself, an immigrant, who, who writes um, in, in letters and so forth to confidence that he was quite torn about this issue um, because the labor movement itself was comprised of so many newcomers, but that to protect the interests of American workers, to guard American wages, to, to be able to keep employers from basically bringing in others who can undermine uh, collective bargaining at any moment, we have to stand for immigration restriction. What Gompers does never quite explains is, okay, if that's your position, why are you so comfortable with literacy tests and national words and quotas as the means to accomplish that? So, yeah, so there's, there's your you know, four. I could keep going on. Many, I could spend the entire time uh, just uh, rattling off on one of these particular perspectives. But what I'd like to do 
um, is just briefly mention that the second half of my paper tries to put these ideas um, in collision and in motion. That is, to think about it at kind of key moments, um, or key periods, I should say, of, of, of conflict in the policy process over these things, what happens? And um, one of the kind of, um, what's the impact of these ideas in aggregate, of having these rival ideological traditions around this issue, is that we often have stalemate. Big surprise. So guess what? We've been waiting you know, for more than two decades for comprehensive immigration reform. This is not new. We've been waiting for Godot and immigration reform at least every generation, sometimes over two generations. So the, the, the 1917 literacy test and then the quota laws that followed were actually a long time coming. The 65 Act was a long time coming. The 86 Immigration Reform and Control Act also reflected um, uh, the fact that we had incredible stalemate on this stuff. And it's, a lot of it has to do with these rival interests and ideological commitments at loggerheads with each other. The other key component, though, at, um, is that when we have had these policy breakthroughs, what has been critical surrounding that is strange bedfellow politics. So not surprisingly, if you have these very different camps, to get, it's very hard to identify moments. There's a few, but very hard to identify moments where one of those camps completely triumphs. To get reform through, they have to engage in building these incongruous alliances um, with others. Um, and so hence, these kind of strange left-right coalitions oftentimes. Um, to produce the reforms, and as a result, and so I spent some time in the paper talking about 1920s legislation, um, reform in, in 65 and reform in 86, and do so to, get, to give people a sense of what happens when these rival reforms go through the meat grinder of American immigration politics and what comes out at the other end. And so in addition to strange bed bedfellow politics, one of the things that often happens then, not surprisingly, is all kinds of contradictory elements are, um, in fact, uh, woven into this, this legislation. So there's clear verdicts. That, you know, the quota laws of the 1920s were draconian and nativist, and yet had certain openings that were meant to be a compromise with free market expansions. Um, likewise, you get to 65. It dismantled the national origins quotas legislation. Some will sell it as a civil rights reform, but as Maynard points out, it also has these very dark restrictionist components in terms of what it meant for Western Hemisphere immigration. Uh, and so forth. So before wearing out my welcome, because I've not been looking at my watch, uh, I actually want to close with, with Haim, because that's where we started, and to kind of give some sense that neither the ideas in my paper nor the thinkers um, uh, that are discussed are static um, on these things. And so um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, very quickly with Haim, and then with, uh, with Cesar Chavez, who I mentioned a moment ago, and then stop. Um, with Hayam, what's fascinating is that Hayam in the 1950s, when his book comes out, is like an a, a alarm for, um, uh, for uh, okay, kind of call to arms for those who want immigration reform. And so he's, he's kind of brought into a lot of discussions going on with the Truman administration and others about the need to get rid of uh, these racist quota laws and so forth. And in that context, a lot of his language sounds pretty liberal cosmopolitan. Okay? By the time you, um, uh, uh, Dr. Hyam is in the 1970s and 1980s, he's deeply concerned about undocumented immigration, which he sees as undermining the rule of law. And he's deeply concerned because he believes that Mexican immigration in large numbers, because of its linguistic qualities, there are echoes of Huntington here, um, poses significant threats to us because he thinks diverse immigration is the key um, for us um, in being successful in terms of our, our experiment uh, with inflows of, of non-citizens and so forth. And so he becomes somebody who's picked up by a lot of restrictionists, um, advocates and so forth, as um, you know, offering ideas, even though he, he thought of himself as clearly not in their camp, those ideas were being very much appropriated by them. And as such, I think you could, you could probably characterize Chaim at, at, towards the end of his life, particularly when he's thinking about unauthorized immigration, as somebody who is more squarely in um, the social justice restrictionist camp. Classic restrictionists and nativists want to claim him as their own, um, but I think you can see, you know, depending on what is specifically on the agenda, a bit of a shift there. Lastly, on Chavez, as I mentioned, late 60s, you could squarely peg him as being in this camp with Frederick Douglass, 
by, by the um, early 70s, he has shifted. He's clearly either thought this through more carefully, calmed down from California, I don't know that the why is exactly about this, or he spent more time with undocumented immigrants. But by then, he's starting to advocate amnesty and a more tolerant policy uh, and finding common cause with um, uh, uh, these uh, Latin American migrants. So with that, I will stop. Thanks.